Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat. I'm talking today with Matthew. Hello. Hi there. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you on board. And for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? So as you mentioned, I'm Matthew Renzi. I'm an AI consultant and transitioning into AI research. Uh, I've been a Microsoft MVP for nine years now, and I live in Las Vegas, Nevada with my wife, Serena. All right. So hey, you're just a five-hour beautiful drive between <laughs> yeah. You know, Lehigh, Utah, and, and uh, in fact, I was thinking about driving down. I'm at an event next month in Vegas, a uh, power platform conference, and was thinking about driving down again because it is a beautiful drive. I don't. Oh yeah, and we've got some hours. great conferences and all the amenities here in Vegas make it totally worth stopping in. I'm just worried about my tires melting on the road at this time <laughs> of year. You know, but it's yeah. Yeah, make sure you have a lot of water in the car just for emergencies. Yes, yes. Well, this is great. So uh, so for nine years, I, we were talking kind of before, like where did you actually start with your MVP? Because the AI category has not been around for nine years. Yeah, so I started in a developer technologies. I was largely working um, as a software developer and data scientist working with Visual Studio as well as uh, Python and a bunch of other tools in that space. And then um, I, I kind of naturally transitioned out of data science into artificial intelligence. It was always my real passion, but data science essentially was how you made money being interested in artificial intelligence at the time. But yeah. since everything has exploded here in AI over the past few years, um, I've been doing a lot more AI consulting and training. And now um, I just finished my master's degree in artificial intelligence at Johns Hopkins University. So I I really got the the bug for doing AI research and I'm hoping to continue doing that. Um, but it's obviously not as profitable doing research as it is to do consulting. So I'll probably still have to balance my time between those two. Well, I'd be interested, like what, what, you know, what are customers interested in around AI consulting? Is that because, uh, you know, I, I know I've got friends that were building chatbots 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that were automating support and help desks and you know, things like that and trying to create kind of self-serve tools. Like what's, what's the kind of the latest, what are people focused on? Right now, it's all large language models. Everybody is interested to see what kinds of problems can we solve with these large language model and generative AI tools. And so um, a lot of what I'm essentially doing is offering advice and recommendation on basic prompt engineering, uh, techniques or patterns like retrieval augmented generation, where we essentially source the information from uh, reliable sources of truth, and then have the large language models ground themselves on it, which prevents hallucination quite well. And then if they don't know the answer, we just uh, instruct them in the prompt to say, I don't know the answer. Or if they do know the answer, they provide the source to the original document. You know, I've been really interested in, I, I heard someone discussing uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, very quickly, very soon, we, we should have, um, uh, you know, that various AI platforms will be able to communicate with each other and do more complex requests that it'll know the limitations of that. It'll know what it's connected to. And this good takes me back like 20 years when we were talking about building like a service bus, we were using, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we, we were automating in the manufacturing space, some of that level of complexity to yeah. be able to do like demand planning. If I make this change, what are the downstream effects within, you know, the, the value chain of building a product to when, due to these design changes, you know, part of the problem we were solving is when will trucks be on the road delivering that product to stores, yeah. you know, based on this change and where it's sourcing materials, kind of all those things. But this, again, this idea of creating this service bus that you can have mm -hmm. different languages, different tools communicating in, it's doing the translation and then communicating back out. Yeah, well, that makes me think of two things. Uh, first is that in the very near future, um, we're gonna be shifting focus most likely from large language models and now uh, large multimodal models to uh, AI agents. So there, it's essentially, it's uh, an agent meaning um, like a, I don't know how you want to describe it. You've got a large language model at the center and this large language model has a wrapper around it that can make observations and then uh, you know think through a chain of thought that leads to an action that then changes the state of an environment, which then leads to another observation. And you keep going through this loop. 
Um, that's essentially what we refer to as an agent. And so if you put a large language model at the center of this, you can get these agents to complete some pretty interesting tasks, including writing basic uh, software, uh, automating a lot of tech support. Uh, they've just recently automated research. There are now research papers that were completely thought up, researched, experimented, and um, written, and then published by AI agents. They're not great. They're essentially like an average uh, entry-level researcher right now. But the, the trajectory of this progress has just been so fast that before long, we will most likely have an army of AI researchers, completely automated researchers, doing experiments and collaborating where they're essentially you know, exchanging information faster than we can through publications and conferences and journals um, or even preprint sites because they'll essentially have like a GitHub-like repository where as soon as they complete their research, it goes in, all the other agents learn from that research, come up with new hypotheses and start uh, you know, running tests or experiments to test their unique idea. And they're also going to not uh, duplicate uh, effort because every other agent will know what the other agents are working on. So they run separate experiments that don't overlap too much to you know, maximize efficiency. Just very different from how uh, human beings are doing it. Similar in some ways, different in others. But that leads to the second thought, which is, I don't remember exactly what the numbers were, but um, it sounds like there is more AI generated content on the internet being created every day than there is human content being created every day. I think somebody looked at Twitter and their estimates were that it's surprisingly way more uh, AI generated content. So the hypothesis is in the near future, rather than, you know, we'll start talking to these agents, you know, you hear them on the phone calls and stuff like that, where they're getting smarter. It's not just like a press one for this option, press two for that. It's like actually listening to what you're saying and then giving you reasonably good recommendations or uh, information based upon that. So right now we're talking to these agents, but before long, these agents are just going to be talking to one another. And then it's probably going to be the case that more communication on the internet happens from agent to agent communication or talking than humans talking to these agents. And everything from, you know, like booking appointments to, uh, you know, in stock, like, you know, picking stocks and automated uh, trading and stuff. Uh, well, that's already happening right now. But essentially, all of these things that we typically talk to another person for, we'll start talking to the AI agents, and then eventually our AI agents will talk to their AI agents, and then it's just the whole economy is just automated. Well, you, you think about that too, like in a practical solution. Like I, I thought for years of uh, when I was uh, traveling a lot more, and even though mm -hmm. you know a company that was paying for that, I mean, going in and having to book all that travel, yeah. uh, and even though you know, like company was paying for the majority. Of it and, and and to add in, if I ever had somebody from the company go and book it, it was never with any yep. of my uh, you know my preferences, preferences yep. within there, like kind of all those things. And so, like I thought of uh, like I had a friend who had one of these uh, uh, online assistants, and she was based down in the Philippines. It was excellent, and and because oh, I'd be nervous about she'd have my credit card information, she'd be doing all this stuff on my behalf. But you needed to have that human element to work out all those details. Mm -hmm. And instead you could have those back and forth, those small transactional, like the little bit of information based on that, this, um, where it, it can make sure that as you're looking for flights and booking hotels and doing kind of all those things, where it's keeping all those things in mind and constantly adjusting things and you know prompting with as it's working on things, even as fast as it goes, where it's coming back and prompting you for decisions like, hey, would this be acceptable or no, yep. keep looking, like those kinds of things. but. Yeah, you could dramatically, uh, uh, you know, take messy processes like that. I even think of something like just calendaring multiple people, mm -hmm. five people from five different companies. Or I do things for the community. Like we do these Ask Me Anything recordings, scheduling those five people. Yeah. Like I, the, I know there's the fine time and then there's following up people. Did you, did you respond to the fine time yet? And kind of doing all those things, drawing that out to get it, finalize it, push it out there. Um, again, I think there's there's opportunity for those kinds of complex activities. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, uh, this creates a lot of uh, questions, like uh, ethical questions and economic questions about labor uh, automation. But when you think about it, every time we put a digital device between some kind of task, whether that's uh, a surgeon operating, you know, teleoperating, uh, like with the robots remotely, um, or even creating lists of instructions and preferences and stuff that we then hand off to an assistant or even have a conversation with them, uh, you know, across Zoom explaining these things. 
all of the anytime we add a digital medium or a communication mode in between them, that equals data that can then be collected to train uh, either large language models through you know text or uh, train machine learning models through the physical surgeon's interactions with the um, you know the patient. And so we're creating tremendous amounts of training data, especially if it's captured, which obviously is why Microsoft was so interested in getting, uh, was it called Time Machine or the thing that recorded everything you do on right. the computer? Yeah, yeah. Because you can learn your freaked out about. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Um, and uh, for good reason. I mean, there's a lot of privacy yeah. concerns with it. But if we want to get to the point where these, you know, our AI assistant uh, knows all of our preferences and how we do work, we have to at some point in time be able to capture that data. And Microsoft, I think, was probably just uh, a little too ahead of the curve with it, where we're just not ready for it as people. But in the same way, like Google Glass, uh, that the technology worked fine. It was society wasn't ready for it. And until you know you start showing up to McDonald's and see every drive-through agent required to wear one of those to make sure your order is correct every time, uh, society won't be ready for it. So there has to be some kind of financial incentive to push that out to to market. And then we see it all over the place, and then we're like, oh yeah, everybody carries a cell phone now. It's it, not weird let's, anymore. Let's be honest. I mean, they came up with the phrase "glass holes" for those people. <laughs> yeah. Really, that we were all kind of angry and making fun of them just because none of us wanted to throw out the change to go purchase the yep. two thousand dollar or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was two grand. And there were leg four. legitimate privacy concerns about that. And I, I completely understand that. But like me, um, I have a pair of uh, lightweight augmented reality glasses. Anytime I'm on a flight more than an hour or two, I put them on. It just looks like I'm wearing a pair of sunglasses and I'm watching educational videos, online courses, movies, you name it. And it's just, I got my little smartphone connected to it via a little cable. Nobody even notices. But, I mean, the yeah. flight attendants probably think I'm hungover since I'm leaving Las Vegas to fly to these right. locations all the time. That's, uh, yeah, I, I've long been a proponent of the, like, the AR solutions. I'm so much yeah. more impressed than the pure vir virtual stuff. I mean, it's, yep. I know there's people that really into that world. I mean, slightly different than the AI stuff you're, you're talking about, but yep. the, I mean, the VR stuff, I mean, cause I, I always say that it's, it's uh, if you've not tried one of these things and these big headsets, but that experience, the pure VR, it's amazing with the crappy graphics that usually comes with it. Yep. How quickly the brain, though, adjusts to that. And so the learning environments and stuff are, are, are amazing. Yep. Um, but I've tried, I've the tried like AR the very, stuff that I yeah. care about. I've tried you know, the very high-end uh, uh, virtual reality devices, like at the Consumer Electronics Show, like the Pimax 8K uh, devices. And you know, you're getting to the point where visually it's looking pretty good. No more screen door effects and stuff. And the tracking and refresh rates are high enough that it isn't you know, distracting. But with like the AR glasses, the AR uh, screen is pushed a bit further, you know, forward through mirrors and whatnot. So you can't really even tell that it's pixelated. I mean, it's, it's, it just looks like you're looking at your computer monitor or tablet if you're holding it in front of your face. And like, I've got a device for mine um, that essentially does motion correction and stuff too. So when you're on a flight and the plane's bumping, you don't see any of it. It's actually correcting and relatively well. Um, and then if you move your head like this, it just kind of slowly moves over with you. So it yeah. makes using the device like in transit extremely valuable. I mean, it's a game changer for traveling for well, me. When Microsoft uh, a few years back, uh, they highlighted, they were talking a lot about IoT and there's really cool things about it, mm -hmm. but they they talked about the, a couple of their AR solutions. Um, one of them was, uh, you know, they were both, I think more like, uh, you know, like manufacturing industry. Yeah. So they use the example of, which I, Again, if you've ever worked, I worked with manufacturing, tech manufacturing companies and went to sites in Japan and, and Philippines and Taiwan and, uh, and, and see that like this, this idea like, hey, we're going to drop in this two ton machine. How do we actually, where will it fit? And so walking around and seeing digitally yeah. through the glasses, oh, it'll fit here, but yes, but how do we get it there and in position? There's no way, okay, that site won't work. Let's find another place. Yeah. Uh, uh, but then the more practical solution was the example used, like your car breaks down. Um, you know nothing about your car. You know, open up the hood, put on the glasses, call your mechanic through that view. They're able to like, hey, right here, and then highlight you know, a little beep, 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 this hose. Like it looks like there's a there's a pressure leak there. I can see something from it, you know, or here's what you can go and do or fix yeah. this or this came off. Um, you know, that is just or even you know, that's that's a real time to get to the point where you could have an augmented uh, like go like we go now to I was talking about beforehand, like going mm -hmm. to YouTube, finding a video that explains 
how to fix my car, my my fancy German engineered car, how I that I knew nothing about this engine like I used to with my old Ford, my 70s, late 70s Ford. Um, but I could fix anything in it and often fixed things in it. Um, this, I have no idea. Just like I could find a video, I could go into an augmented YouTube video that walks through it, but then actually shows it in my car as yep. I'm looking at it. This thing highlights those pieces and walks me through that. Like we're very rapidly approaching that. Yeah, and not even YouTube videos. I mean, I, I see a future very relatively soon anyways, where you've got AI assistance and say you want to fix that car. You know, you're not just watching a video showing you how to do it while you're looking at your car. It's looking at your car, mapping it to a you know a digital twin of the car, seeing where the specific problems are from sensor readings, and then a little avatar is popping up and saying, "Yeah, go here and do this and stuff." Let so me, you're interacting Clippy with an AI. Come on, the little wizard. What's his name? Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, Clippy. <laughs> well, there's Clippy. Clippy and he was the wizard guy too. Yeah. You know, uh, it yeah. was Merlin. Um, I Mer I know okay. because I actually wrote a program with him uh, years, many years ago. Proud of that moment. Is it on the resume still? <laughs> no, no, that was, uh, in fact, I think I got in trouble for it because it was not considered a valuable use of developer time, but oh well. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, in thinking of, you know, I, own, yeah. I had the, the HoloLens, the version one of the HoloLens, and when I first used it, I mean, I was tremendously impressed. Some of the tech demos were just mind-blowing. It's like, oh, yeah, how can this not happen in, like, the next five years? And then it just didn't. And you know, I still don't exactly know why it didn't happen. I mean, I know there's product market fit. It was not a consumer device. I know the right. industry just wasn't ready either. And I think digital twins weren't, you know, most people didn't even know what that was. But you know, once you have digital twins, then those devices increase in value quite a bit because you can actually, you know, make that digital to analog brain conversion through those devices. And so I have to imagine it's gonna happen sometime, but I think for it to really break out. Uh, we have to get to the point where I have these lightweight, um, you know, just like a regular pair of glasses, maybe a little bit heavier. Right now they're tethered to the smartphone or your computer, but um, once they get wireless, uh, I think that's that's where we start to see this actually pick up steam. Yeah, no, I think that's where, uh, you know, you know, probably like having like 6G like type speeds yeah. where you have that wherever you're on the world. So it's obviously with 6G, as we all know, that's it'll also automatically through through the uh, Bluetooth, give you any uh, COVID vaccines and also um, help you get direct emails from Bill Gates somehow. Anyway. Um, <laughs> you, yeah, I, I'm sure they're much like uh, the movie version of Ready Player One, but I don't think this was in the book. Uh, oh, we can increase advertising space in their displays by 30% without causing a seizure. Right. Somebody's going to try figuring out a way to make a free device that's either capturing all of your data so it can be sold to somebody else cool. or market directly to you every time you walk past a starbucks oh hey you know click this yeah. button to but order your latte th that's actually an ar scenario that uh, like not that exactly but the idea of hey i've got my shopping list if i'm walking down it says hey you, know, you actually have a coupon or there's a sale at this store and it lights up like you do in, in some yep. buildings or or like in uh you know ready player one or or uh, uh, you know, Ender's Game lights up the floor, the direction oh, yeah, the yeah. that has that thing, or or you know does reminders based on that, like hey, it was on your shopping list to go and didn't they actually have that or they're right here or whatever that is. Yeah, um, I mean, I, there's I love a, that kind of stuff. a lot of use cases that make a lot of sense, but you know, obviously, you got to get the technology to the point where it's not an inconvenience to use, and you have to get society to the point where. It just seems normal. And like right now, like if you would have, if, if people that have been in prison for like a few decades or whatever, uh, when they get out and they get asked, what's the most different thing about society from when you're in prison to when you're out? They almost always say, everybody is staring at that black screen. It's just, it's so, you know, it's so ubiquitous. We just see it as normal. But I mean, it's a really odd thing to do like staring at a screen all day long, even while there's all these potential conversations and interactions around you. And so I think it's gonna be very similar where, you know, like we might not even call them computers anymore. We just, oh yeah, uh, do it on your glasses, you know, and then you just, you know, put them on, do whatever work you're trying to do and then you move on, so. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Well, I know we've, we've gotten kind of deep dive into some yeah. of the subject matter. A couple of questions I have here before, before we wrap up. So one, I do always like to ask, and I know it's been nine years, but what was your process to becoming an MVP? Like you were aware of people on the program, 
find out about it? Did somebody reach out to you? Like, what did that what did that process look like? Well, it started with friends of mine who were MVPs. For some completely unknown reason, the number of Microsoft MVPs we had in Des Moines, Iowa, was much higher than just about anywhere else I know that it isn't a major tech center. And so, because so many of my close friends uh, had become MVPs, I got kind of interested in it myself. The advice everybody gave me was, don't try to become an MVP. Uh, do the things you love, and if it's enough to become an MVP, then get the MVP. Right. And right. so that's essentially what I focused on. Um, I, cause you'd burn yourself out if you just tried doing this all day long and didn't love doing it. But I was speaking at so many conferences and uh, beginning to speak internationally and then, uh, writing articles and just essentially all the things that, you know, good MVPs do, I was already doing. And then, um, a friend of mine's, Hey, you know, we're interested in nominating you. Are you interested? And I was like, Oh yeah, very much. And once I became an MVP, I mean, the number of doors it opened was uh, astonishing. I just had no idea, but not just doors to like conferences and stuff, uh, connections with people. And so the MVPs that I interact with at the MVP summit or um, you know, just at the conferences I'm at or friends of mine now that we just go out and do stuff for fun when they're in Las Vegas, uh, those things, those, those relationships have been really valuable to me personally, but also professionally. Almost every major opportunity in my career has come from a conversation in a hallway at a conference with one of these MVPs. Well, th that's a great kind of segue and you've kind of answered half the question was uh, because I'm sure you've had, like we all do, once you become an MVP, I mean, the same day that you be, you learned you're an MVP and share it with somebody, you get the question and somebody says, well, how do I become an MVP? Yeah. <laughs> what advice What advice do you give people that have say, hey, that is, I do enjoy giving back to the community what should I be doing? What are the right steps? Well, once again, don't try to become an MVP, but if you want to become the kind of person that wins an MVP award, uh, speaking at conferences, um, becoming a leader in your in your technology community, largely in terms of education. So um, writing articles is a great way. Uh, international public speaking uh, works really well too. Uh, I created a lot of online courses. I created a lot of free videos. Um, just all the stuff I love doing seems to be exactly the stuff that Microsoft was looking for for an MVP. Oh, and being a, an expert like uh, in your technology stack. And um, I don't know if you're interested, but I'm also a Microsoft regional director, and that has a very different set of criteria for what they're looking for in a regional director. So you can think of it like an MVP. You're a technology community leader for your tech community, but in the RD space, you're essentially an industry leader uh, so rather than teaching individuals how to use these technologies, you're having conversations with uh, C-level executives and teaching entire companies how to do these things. Yeah, it's a, well also an RD. So it's, uh, yeah, and there's, uh, for folks that, that I would say most people don't know what an RD oh, is. sorry. What's the best naming mechanism of, of that any, yep. anyway? It is not like a, hey, you're an MVP for so many years and you've graduated up in RD. Completely different things. Yep, exactly. I, I, I say the difference between them, the best description is like we are unpaid advisors yep. to Microsoft. Uh, and so inside the company, most people don't even know what an RD is, but the leadership class, like the upper level, I was yeah. uh, described to me at one point is that it's like we're, uh, we're, we're like a, uh, we have like a direct connection to like the top. 300 executives yeah. inside the company. So for example, um, we have distribution uh, lists at Microsoft where if I have a question, uh, or well, more like if I have a suggestion for a product, I'm like, hey, you know, I've been using this with my clients, it's brand new, but it'd be really useful if it could do this. Uh, we submit that to a distribution list. Um, all of our uh, regional directors, you know, will respond back to it. And uh, these emails end up, you know, sometimes going all the way up to the top of Microsoft, right. Sadia Nadella. Oh, yeah. Uh, reads these emails if, if yep. you know they pertain I've seen to he's stuff. responded a couple of things I mean Guthrie's response yep. to stuff I mean over my stuff and then the collaboration stack I mean I, I know Jeff Teeper but he's often responding and will then have one of his lieutenants like assign like hey mm -hmm. this person will follow you up or hey take a look at this this question this issue yep. so uh, you know and that'll be like somebody posts the question there's some commentary but they're usually very quick yeah, picking that up and, and taking action. And we have priority for tech support issues too. So if we have a client that's having some serious issues and we can't, you know, get them resolved through the normal channels, we can escalate it. And I mean, it gets taken care of like the next day. Uh, you'll hear a response in 
Yeah. I always say that, if, you know, uh, the, the RD uh, DLs are the place to go and whine and complain about the uh, <laughs> Azure problems. Yeah, like unfortunately, unfortunately, they, they get that way every now and then. But for the most part, uh, we just remind people, hey, you know, this isn't a place to vent. Uh, these are conversations that are moving the company further forward in a positive way. Right. Yep. No, it's great. Well, well, Matthew, really appreciate your time today. For folks that want to reach out to you, connect with you, where are you most social? Where can people find you? So the best way to learn more about what I do or the courses and stuff that I create uh, is to go to my website, which is MatthewRenzi.com. On there, I also have a contact page, which will link you to every social media profile I spend any time on. Excellent. We'll have that, of course, all of that out of the blog, out on YouTube, out on the SoundCloud podcast. Matthew, thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Wow!